The nutrition scientist Stefan Goyenet has a sentence in his book that has stuck with me. The best heuristic in nutrition we have is to eat minimally refined foods. It isn't a perfect heuristic because foods like vinegar are thought to be healthy, whereas foods like beef are thought to be not, even though it's a whole food. Well, I have a heuristic like that when it comes to the question of which voices should we listen most closely to. I think the most credible voices are scientists who actually do science and publish the papers that the rest of us read. It's not a perfect heuristic, and one of the unfortunate aspects of it is most scientists who are actually in the lab doing science are not on social media doing YouTube. Every now and then we get a great exception, a scientist who's capable of doing research, publishing papers, has great credibility, and is also a pretty good YouTuber, and that's Gil Carvalho, he's popular. I think we're all very lucky to have a very good scientist like that active on social media, especially YouTube, and I got a dozen requests to interview him. He has the YouTube channel Nutrition Made Simple, and he does a good job of sticking to that mantra. I was as interested in finding out who is this guy, and what is his background, and why is he doing this, because the dark corners of the internet are going to go after any really good scientist out there, right? So let's find out why we're so lucky to have him, and why he's willing to take time off from a very promising scientific career to do this. Hello, Gil. How are you? Les, how are you? I'm good. Do I pronounce it Gil? Yeah, the, there's m multiple pronunciations. Yeah, pe most people in the U.S. call me Gil. So it's midnight your time in Lisbon? Yeah. Wow, you're a night owl. Yeah, I I do work later at night and also at this, at this time it's quieter. Everybody's gone to sleep, so it's easier to get, uh, to get a block of time without interruptions. Did you grow up in Lisbon? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I grew up a little bit all over the place. I was born in Lisbon, then moved to Brazil when I was like two years old, and then spent several years there, then lived in Africa for a couple of years, and then wow. came to back to Portugal. Yeah, back to Portugal when I was 10 years old. So 10 wow. to 25, 26, I lived in Portugal, then, then moved to the US for grad school, and spent like 17 years in, in, the, in California. And now I'm back here kind of helping with the the family health sitch. Yeah, uh, it's really big of you. I, I, uh, you're a little bit of a man of mystery, it seems to me, on the internet. You don't go around bragging about your scientific credentials other than to say you're a scientist. And uh, I noticed I watched some of your first videos and you just started off talking about nutrition. You didn't say, hey, I'm Gil and this is what I know about it. The title of your videos is A Scientist Thinks, you know, yada, yada, yada. I wanted to take just a minute and explore some of your feelings, if you don't mind. I came across this paper in Nature in 2013 about the nature of feelings. I wonder if you had any feelings yeah. about that paper. Great feelings about that paper. It was a really, really interesting collaboration. I worked with uh, Antonio Damasio, who is a neuroscientist. We worked together for uh, about seven years. As a, I was a, a research scientist in his neuroscience institute. And that paper... You know, it was just phenomenal writing that paper with him. He's uh, he's like a legend in the, in, the, in the neurosciences. So working with him and writing that paper, you know, just sitting at, at a table with him and kind of, uh, you know, like like chopping and kind of connecting minds was, was fascinating. The way he thinks, just exchanging ideas and going through through stuff is like fascinating. Uh, and and it was a great paper, like for for me uh, because it's. It's it's got so many citations and it's got it made a lot of a big big a big splash. Uh, like career wise, it was great. I found it fascinating, <clears throat> and I never would have known about it if I wasn't doing a little bit of background sleuthing about you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, that's who what this mystery man is. Oh, I found now, out. Some what else things. did you find? No, well, roll out my criminal record now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you updated the paper, right? We wrote a couple of a couple of uh, updates with other ideas that we had. And then we conducted experiments too, to test some of the, some of the underlying thoughts. And then that, that second one kind of updated and, and elaborated on some of the principles that we laid out in the first one. You know, uh, we're both YouTubers. You're a bigger YouTuber than me and you've been at it for longer and you're more qualified. I don't know about that, man. You're doing, doing a great job. Well, thank you. But I, my approach is a little bit different. I come from another field, come from earth science. By the way, uh, the Lisbon earthquake is fascinating to earth scientists. I did a public television documentary in 1990 uh, while I was at Stanford 
on historical earthquakes. And the Lisbon, that was a big earthquake and it changed the course of history. And when I walk around Lisbon and I can see where the buildings have been replaced and which ones stood and so on. Oh, there's so many fascinating things about that. And I know this is tangential, maybe I'll edit it out. But one of the most interesting thing is it occurred on All Saints Day at the height of All Saints Day, you had a square with four cathedrals. Services were going on when this earthquake happened. The pious people who were there for the early morning services ran into the square, good to get out of the buildings. And in the meantime, the candle holders tipped over and lit the curtains on fire on those cathedrals. And it caused them to collapse. And what was interesting is the, uh, the heathen who were on the beach they weren't hurt by stones falling and everything like the pious were. But the ocean withdrew and they got curious about that because there's treasure and ships, you know, that sunk and all that. And little did they know that that would mean a tsunami would come and wipe most of them out. But the ones who seemed to get off scot-free, the front wall of the prison fell down. <laughs> and so a lot of prisoners escaped who were political prisoners from the Portuguese royalty. In the red light district, they, those were just made of wooden shacks, so they didn't fall down either. So if you were off in the red light district, you were fine, but if you were in a cathedral, it was trouble for you. I shouldn't laugh about this. Yeah, I, d I didn't know about uh, many of those details. We study the earthquake and, the, and everything that followed in school, uh, in high school, but uh, some of those details I had never heard. So you're, you're a scientist and a history buff. Yeah, I am kind of a history buff. <laughs> And this is supposed to be about you, but I have a story to tell about low carbohydrate diets later on that may interest some of our viewers, but I, I, I wanna get back to you. You know, I was really excited to see a real scientist. You'll notice in my episodes, I lean on the scientists, try to more than my own you know, opinion. It reminds me of um, a guy that I knew, Walt Mossberg, who was a reviewer of uh, consumer electronics for the Wall Street Journal, and he became the best known one. And he said his idea was not to be the expert, but to be the consumer and couch it in consumer terms. And that's how he became so popular. He didn't have a master's in electrical engineering. He wasn't a fanboy of, you know, the, of Apple and so on. Uh, he just represented the consumer. That's what I'm trying to do on my channel is represent my heroes, which are scientists like yourself. And to me, to see a real scientist who actually does science being also a popular YouTuber, it's like, ah. Oh. I don't know about the popular part. You're getting there. I think that we need more scientists that talk directly to the public. And uh, I think I think it is increasing. When I first started making the videos about, I don't know, three, four years ago, whatever it was, there were less. Hmm. And that's part of the reason that I started making the videos is that I saw a lot of, a lot of diet content, but very little nutrition content so there's a lot, there were a lot of low fat channels, low carb channels, the vegan channels, the, the paleo channels. And when I say channels, it could be a YouTube channel, it could be a blog, it could be a podcast. But there was a lot of that. Here's the diet and here's, you know, all the reasons why our diet is perfect and why, all the reasons you should do it. But there was very little um, actual nutrition, like, like just here's the science. Uh, there's, you know, I can think of, I don't know, one or two examples, ex exceptions really. But uh, fortunately, I think with time that has changed and there's a, there are more scientists now. Uh, on, some on YouTube and on, on Twitter, there's, you know, you can, we have access now to a lot of leading scientists and that's phenomenal. I sometimes talk about that in my videos and I encourage viewers to, to get in touch with these people, to ask them questions and to engage with them because um, I think a lot of the problems we have with misunderstandings stem from the fact that people are not exposed to high quality scientific information. They don't have a reference of what solid science sounds like. All they have a lot of times is the hype and the oversimplifications. Uh, and so it's it's hard to, to establish that, um, to distinguish, right? To, 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 to be able to tell what's reliable and what's not. But I, I've always believed that just exposing people to the scientists, the, the great scientists on Twitter, you know, the Kevin Halls and the, and the, the all this crowd, uh, there's some, there's a, there's a new batch now, the, the people that, that joined recently. Uh, and we have, and there's epidemiologists that people, they're the run uh, randomized control trials for a living. 
There's people from metabolism. There's people from, you know, from all of these different, from nutrition specifically and from, um, from lipidology, from cardiovascular r research. And, uh, and uh, as we have more, or as people have the opportunity to have more exposure, and as also the other part is we have a, a duty, I think, to get better at communicating with people because that's, that's a big gap in scientific training. Scientific training, you know this, we get trained to narrow our thoughts and to narrow our language and to talk to other specialists right? in, in, in almost a, an impenetrable, um, almost a, like a, a language of its own. But then translating those ideas to a general audience is almost a, a separate skill and something that, that scientists as a rule are not good at at all. And I include myself in that batch. The whole three or four years that I've been making videos has been just a huge learning curve for me. Just how do I explain this in a way that makes sense and that people can relate uh, to, the, to what I'm saying? And I'm still very much every day I'm learning. And, and people, you know, I learn from people who watch the videos and explain, like, this part was really made sense and this part did not so much was confusing. And so I think it's, a, it's a, another kind of... Uh, of, uh, of training experience, of translating the, the, the understanding or the, the, the science in ways that make sense to people. And the irony is that a lot of times the people with, with the, that are the best at communicating and the best at storytelling and the best at internet marketing and all these things that are crucial, not all, all often don't have the scientific substance and vice versa. People who who understand the science the best and are deeply steeped in science don't know how to communicate it. So we have a real dilemma, uh, which just just really um, warps the exposure of the public uh, to, to things and to messages. So yeah, I think it's in part something that will be addressed with time as sci scientists get more and more on social media and understand the importance. And then there's a there's a, a side of it that is is it's our effort we have to get better at communicating it it's just that's just there's no way around that. Yeah, I agree with you 100. percent I I tried to do I did an oils episode last episode I did about three weeks ago and I tried to avoid all the confusing language that surrounds oils. But scientists have done some crazy things in, in the naming. You know, omega threes. Yeah. Does anybody get that it was named after the Greek alphabet where the beginning is alpha and the end is omega and omega-3 means it's a chain of carbon atoms and the first double bond is three units from the end. Yeah, the nomenclature is the problem. I mean, in lipids, I do a lot of videos on cholesterol and heart disease and all these topics because it's so, so crucial. And there, there's such a huge gap between what science has figured out and what is mainstream knowledge. But the terminology is a nightmare. I mean, the, 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 the LDL and LDL cholesterol are two completely different things. There's some relation, but they're two different things. And when most people, including doctors, say LDL, they really mean LDL cholesterol. I mean, the, and, and, then, and then you have HDL and HDL cholesterol, which are also different things, but people also say HDL when they mean HDL cholesterol. It's just a nightmare for, for you know, the average uh, citizen. It's, it's a lot of my videos end up being about how do I present this and how do I explain the terminology? Like we have to, to present a clear picture. At the same time, it has to have scientific substance. It has to explain a minimum of terminology and a minimum of, uh, of scientific content, but in a way that doesn't put people to sleep in the first 30 seconds. Um, so that's the, the hardest part about making these videos is, is that balance between enough science, but streamlined, like simple. And, you know, a lot of times we make mistakes and either the video oversimplifies something and the audience complains, oh, why didn't you explain that other thing? Well, because we thought it was already too much content for a five minute video. And, um, you know, and other times um, uh, we give too much. We, we put too too much into a five minute video and people end up confused or, or like it's not entirely clear. So it's a constant balancing act. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something that I, again, every video I'm learning and every, uh, the feedback, the, the great thing about YouTube is you get constant feedback, right? You get almost in real time. Like you put up a video 
and you immediately people tell you, okay, this was great or not so good. Um, and they tell you specifically, like, I love this analogy or this wasn't clear or they, the questions they ask make it very clear what, what, they, what wasn't um, clearly explained or not. And so that has, that has helped me a lot, just getting that feedback and then tweaking as we go along, kind of course correcting continuously and getting better. Like I've, I've made, you know, I'll make a video about, a, about the same topic maybe six months later and where we're going a little bit further, but I'm working on the analogies and working on the way to present it and the, the explanations. Um, and so I can... I, I feel like it's it's improving, but I think I have a lot of work to do in terms of presenting, you know, compelling, a compelling story, a compelling structure to things. That's where, and, and people tell me this, people around me tell me this, like it's still too scientific, it's still too jargony, and you, I know that I tend to worry more about these details, the, you know, the bar graphs or the p-values, than the things that matter to the to the regular viewer which is, does the story make sense? Is it clear? Is it compelling? What's the bottom line? This is something that people keep keep you know, insisting with me. Like, what's your bottom line? Okay, you're talking about all these molecules. I go into the kitchen. Why do I care, right? This is something that people have helped me a lot. My family and friends and colleagues who uh, see the videos and sometimes they, they look at the scripts before the videos and kind of the, the, the backbone of what we're going to do and uh, I get a lot of feedback that way. And a lot of times it's like, well, what's your, what's, your, what's your bottom line? You can't just be, you know, some academic thing. It can, but at the end of the day, people want a bottom line. They want an explanation of something they can, they, they can apply to their lives. I still brushed over too lightly your background. First of all, you have a combination of an MD and a PhD. That's a little bit unusual. And they're separated by quite a few years. You got your MD in Lisbon what, 20 years ago now? Mm. And did you have a specialty? What? No, right after, so right after I graduated medical school, I went, I went to, to grad school to get my PhD. So in, here in Portugal, this is a, maybe an irrelevant detail, but here in Portugal, they, there was no MD-PhD program. And uh, so I graduated medical school and I decided I wanted to do research. So I moved to the U.S., and went to grad school and, and got my PhD at Caltech. So it's not it's not the typical yeah in biology. It's not the typical in biology, yeah. Uh, so for for like for most Americans, it's not the typical way that people get an MD PhD. It's usually there's a, there's joint programs, but here at least at the time, I don't know if now. I don't think I still I don't think there's still something like that. But at the time, it didn't exist, so I had to do it that way. He has been a member of the Genetic Society of America and the American Society for Neuroscience. His accolades include a mm -hmm. DeLille Nasser Award for Professional Development in Genetics and a Mothers Foundation Award. Both his research contributions and his expert commentary are regularly featured in the media, including the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Nature Methods, the San Diego Union Tri Tribune, Quantum Magazine, and Science Daily. He's also a contributor to the Institute of Limbic Health and the T. Colin Campbell Center of Nutritional Studies. Your PhD in biology was heavily focused towards neurology, brain health? No, it was uh, a lot of, well, we started with the main interest in aging. Mm. So we wanted to figure out the biology of aging. And one of the interventions that is very effective in aging, and this is using model organisms, uh, with just lab animals, right? Like and nematodes, flies. fruit flies, stuff like that. Yeah. So you you measure lifespan in these animals, and then you can make you can make like genetic uh, manipulations. You know, crank up a gene or or knock out a gene and see if that affects lifespan. So we did that a lot. And one of the the kind of the poster interventions that manipulate lifespan is caloric restriction, classical intervention. So. Uh, uh, tweaking the, the diet effects uh, can extend life or, or, or not. And so because of that, we did a lot of work with nutrients, you know, playing with the nutrient levels and playing with uh, then messing with uh, nutrient sensing pathways uh, genetically and biochemically and looking at the effect on longevity, on lifespan. And, and you also end up looking at physiology as well as a result of those manipulations. So that's how I first started getting into nutrition, 
we did a lot of work, you know, playing with carbs, playing with, with the protein, playing with uh, the fats in the food, and then seeing what effect that had on, on longevity and on, on health of the animals. And we published a number of papers on that. Uh, so that was the kind of the, the, the departure point. And then it continued, uh, you know, with a, the more with the human interest. In fact, I've got one of your papers here on sucralose. Oh, right, right, right. Sucralose and how it puts you into, since it's non-caloric, it seems to put the flies into a fasting state of some kind. And they make up for it after they get off the sucralose. Right. That was basically, it was a paper that somebody published uh, suggesting an effect, direct effect on the brain. But we did some experiments and it, we thought it just manipulated appetite. It just changed how much how much the flies were eating. In this case, it was fruit flies. Uh, and so it kind of kind of changed that story. Yeah, we did a lot of that, like what what nutritional manipulations affect appetite, which ones are rexogenic, like increase appetite or decrease appetite, and that ends up having an effect on aging as well. So yeah, real a real scientist. I know you don't want to be called a vegan because you don't want to be labeled and you're worried about the bias or something that goes with no, it. I don't, I don't mind people labeling me whatever they want to label me. But people label me all kinds of things on the, on the videos. Uh, we've gotten, I've gotten labeled everything from vegan to meat apologist and everything in between. So I, it doesn't bother me. But when people, when people ask me what I eat, uh, even though it's not the focus of the videos, cause I, I don't think it matters that much. Um, I, I favor uh, plant foods, uh, but I make, always make it, make, it, make it clear that it's not because I think including a lot more animal foods than I do is necessarily going to be detrimental to my health. It's mainly the externalities. It's mainly, for me, number one is the climate impact. There's just, you know, the, the impact of, of uh, particularly red meat is so disproportionate in terms of car the carbon footprint that I just can't can't bring myself to include it in a, in a diet as, as it is. If one day they figure out the, the lab meats, and if we have a reason to believe that they're reasonably healthy, at least in small amounts, and if they, if they make it at scale so that the environmental impact is, is much smaller, you know, I, I could eat some red meat one, once in a while, but as it is with the externalities, with the, the cost, the price tag, uh, I just can't justify it. Yeah, so having been an earth scientist, I'm with most earth scientists. We have we all have PTSD from what we've seen. It's just you can't unsee that stuff. You know, I I know emergency workers, and they probably have much worse case of PTSDs, and they're probably looking at this saying, "Oh, poor baby." Um, but it's pretty bad. Um, you know, for example, um, I was involved in water testing, and. Uh, we had 34 labs. Well, we had 128 labs around the world and 34 of them were specialized in water testing, unnecessary detail. Anyway, uh, some of them were in the Chesapeake uh, Bay water drainage uh, or watershed and, and um, a lot of chicken farms there, foster farms is there and so on. They've, so they're very tightly packed and they have very concentrated manure. The ammonia level in the manure is unbelievable. Uh, and the workers smell it and their children smell it and it gets into the water table and into the streams and it goes down in the Chesapeake Bay and it kills any of the bottom feeders, you know, like oysters and lobsters and destroys the fishing industry in Boston and everybody gets in a war about it, but you're not going to beat Foster Farms because they got the biggest balance sheet. And so, you know, the parents that try to sue and it's, it's hopeless, you know, they're, they're just going to keep doing it. So, but once you see that, and it's the same with cattle farming and you know, once you see that and you see what it's doing to the water table and the children downstream and everything else, it's just like, ah! Uh. Yeah. So it, I, it's, it's, I think fish is probably a little bit healthy, you know. You know, I don't know about being whole plant. I just don't think there's enough data. If maybe you can correct me on 100% whole plant diets versus pescatarian diets. The Adventist studies seem to indicate they're on a par with each other. So I might eat a little fish if it weren't for the environmental aspect. Um, and the human and the animal cruelty and I don't like pandemics. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons. There's six reasons to eat the plants. Yeah, um, essentially, essentially that's my reasoning as well. Um, and fish is a good fish is a good example because fish is likely health promoting um, or neutral. There's just there's just looking at the evidence kind of um, 
Broadway, Broadwise, it's just very difficult to tell people to not eat fish. Uh, you know, most of, most of the, the direct comparisons are, are either neutral or beneficial with fish, even when, you, when you're comparing fish to plant foods in substitution analysis. There's maybe one study that I've seen where fish comes out, comes out looking worse, but otherwise it's either a tie, you know, or depending what you're comparing it to, fish looks better. And yeah, the, the Adventists, yeah, I, I don't see a clear superiority of the completely plant-based ver versus the Piscatarians. Some outcomes look like a, uh, tilting one way and the others tilt the other way. It, and I think in part is because once you get to a dietary pattern, that is largely, that is pretty health promoting, largely, you know, unprocessed plants, whether you have, you're eating fish a couple of times a week or not, assuming that all the, the essential nutrients are there is not going to make, I doubt that it's going to make a huge difference either way. Now, now if you're getting long chain omega threes from the fish and you're not getting them from the plants, does that make a difference long term? That's a, that's a controversy. Um, but yeah, I, Fish is a good example that I like to bring up in my videos because looking at the nutrition data, it's something that, you know, objectively you have to tell people this is this is a good move, like include more, especially for Westerners, right? Switching from a bit more red meat to a bit more fish. I mean, there's no there's no contest. But yeah, the reason the only reason I don't I avoid fish is the there are the externalities again, not not nutrition. So one of the things that was a breath of fresh air for me, you know, coming from a scientific perspective is the way you think. One of the episodes that I liked the most was your one on logical leaps. And I've, I've always wondered why, you know, for example, in the liquid oils, they like to call them seed oils, there is a group of people who are just devoting their lives, fully believing that seed oils are the causes of the diseases of civilization. They're poison, you know, it's very emotional. You talked about storytelling. Well, that's a great story because it's so emotional. Scientists aren't that emotional. Great stories have a lot of emotion to them. So they got a great story, you know. The cause of skin cancer is seed oil. It's not sunshine, you know, and, and so on. But when you get looking at the data, there's tons and tons of data from class A scientists and class A studies that just are overwhelming that they're not harmful and in substitution for saturated fat of any kind except maybe chocolate, uh, they're so much more healthy. Why does it persist that we have at least a dozen high-profile social media people saying seed oils are the devil? It's a good question. I've thought about it. Um, first of all, I think the oil thing, and, and I, when I started making videos three or four years ago, this seed oil craze was not on my radar, but the oil, um, Hatred was already there, but interestingly, it was the more the kind of whole plant food, whole plant based camp that had this this almost hatred of olive oil and olive oil. Some people would go as far as saying olive oil causes heart disease. There was this whole thing that was that was a, that was a thing on social media. And at the time, uh, before I looked into the data, I didn't have a strong opinion on olive oil. Even though I'm Portuguese, um, I don't care particularly either way. Um, and I remember one, at one point I decided, okay, let me look into the data and see what this actually says. And the data was so consistent toward benefit of olive oil, so consistent with the, the exception of cer certain acute markers like um, FMD, right? Uh, flow mediated dil dilation. But even there, there were so many gaps in that argument. You know, I ha we have a whole video on it that it's like uh, probably two or three years old by now, but, but still one that, uh, that, I, that I really enjoyed making because I just look at the data and I go, this is insane. This idea that olive oil is unhealthy has no support from the science. Um, and so now we see this, this basically this transposition to another dietary camp that tends to be the more low carb, very animal heavy, uh, diets. And they are now up in arms about oils. And interestingly, olive oil seems to be fine for them, but it's this, these other, uh, the omega-6 oils that they've mainly seem to focus on. But the story is exactly the same that when you look at the, the data, 
and you just go through it systematically, just overwhelming and consistent benefit. And so, and now, now the, it's a very interesting sociological question. Why do these things persist? And I mean, this obviously is not specific to nutrition. We see, you know, all the way from climate change denial to, you know, anti-vaxxing and to, you know, flat earth, all these movements where you would think in, in I don't know, 10 minutes, half an hour, an hour, you, you would be able to show people enough evidence that, would, that they would go, oh, okay, I see. It's the opposite of what I, but that, that never seems to happen. Almost never, right? In fact, there's, there's, some, uh, psych, there's some psychological uh, trials where they show that when you have a firmly held belief and you're shown evidence against it, you actually emerge with a stronger conviction of your beliefs. So there's, there's something about um, just the way we form our, our beliefs when they're emotional. And I think a part, a part of that is just social, right? It's social interactions that a lot of times these beliefs are not academic perspectives on an abstract topic. People form these views not because they went over the evidence and they decided it goes to the left, but because they heard from somebody they like or somebody they trust that it goes to the right. And because there's a community with which they identify and people that they connect with and they have they share these common beliefs and that community strongly advocates that it goes to the right. So now they believe it very strongly. So I think when we, and this is something that we have to be aware of as, as science communicators, if you want to call it that, when we're explaining to somebody that a commonly held belief is not supported by the evidence and that the evidence goes in the opposite direction, it's much more complicated than just showing people, here's the data and just accept it. You're asking people to change their entire perspective, sometimes who they are in the world, right? Because all these beliefs are tightly linked to their self-image, who I trust, what my values are, here's my, my tribe, these other people over here are the tribe that is not as good and we don't trust them. And, and when you approach these topics, it's incredibly difficult from a psychological standpoint. You're asking them to basically betray all of these, um, the self-image and these, these concepts. And basically for somebody to, you know, who's deeply ingrained in one of these communities, let's use the example of, of people who a couple of years ago, it was, it was the olive oil is, is causes heart disease. For somebody in that camp, to suddenly start saying, no, olive oil is actually health promoting, you know, they're gonna get ostracized, they're gonna get people who they interact with on a daily basis are not gonna like the fact that they're questioning these, these um, core beliefs. So it goes, it's a lot, it's a lot more complicated than just, oh, here's the, here's the facts, just, just flip on a dime. Um, and I think that's why you have all these, all of this emotional resistance. And then, and then on top of that, there are, there are, um, anecdotes that people extrapolate. So for example, with, with seed oils, a lot of people, when I, when I share a study showing a benefit of, of liquid vegetable oils, a lot of people are irate because they say, look, I eliminated seed oils from my diet and I lost weight and my metabolism improved in all these different ways. How can you say you're killing people by saying this? How can you tell them that, uh, that it has benefits? But of course, when you understand what an anecdote is, that there's a million moving pieces, and when you ask them follow-up questions, usually what they mean is they eliminated junk food. And then they, and then a lot of junk foods contain seed oils, and then they are extrapolating, or they are, you know, by association, they're um, indicting the seed oil, other, and not the other 10,000 components of, of, you know, donuts and whatever else. Uh, so there's all these different moving pieces and it's very, it's very difficult to, to get people to, to see things clearly when there's so much emotion involved. So I don't know what the, the answer is. I think, I think the storytelling is, is definitely a big component. Um, and I think repetition is a big part of it as well. People, people don't change their minds just because they hear an idea once. The thing with the olive oil, for example, this gives me some hope is, this was a, a pretty decent, uh, sizable movement or belief, and now you, you don't hear about it nearly as much 
people have largely abandoned this idea that olive oil it causes heart disease or that it's detrimental. So I think these these trends kind of come come and go, um, and slowly, very slowly, the scientific concepts do penetrate and do get ingrained. But it's an incredibly slow, slow and, and kind of painstaking process. By the way, uh, while we're talking about seed oils, I just interviewed Cyrus Kambata and Robbie Barbero um, from Mastering Diabetes. Mm because I really wanted to dig down on some of these things and I wanted to, them to defend themselves on the, on the oil hypothesis. They don't, pro, they're not, they don't want to be seen as the nutrition police, but they discourage the use of any oils if you're diabetic. And it seems that the clusters of doctors and scientists who are down on the oils that are credible, they're not conspiracy theorists or leaning on anecdotes or making the logical leaps that you're talking about. Oh, it inflames the mitochondria, therefore reduces your life expectancy, and they make a leap to human outcomes. Uh, they're not that. Uh, Cyrus is very smart, he's got a PhD in biochemistry, and he's been, he's been in this for a long time. And he said, no, you know, for type 1 diabetics, we have really good data uh, that we're generating on how much insulin they use uh, compared to their diet. And you can, they can eat 700 grams of carbohydrate a day and only use 30 units of insulin. But as soon as you start letting that be fat, saturated fat is obviously the worst, but the more fat you add to it, the, f the more units of insulin we have to give them. And that's across the thousands of people that we've had in our, so I, I give a little space to the ones who are dealing with the really acutely ill, like Caldwell Esselstyn. I don't know how you feel about that, but it seems to me for the general public who's metabolically healthy, olive oil is associated with healthy habits and not eating the, you know, the saturated fat and so on. And so the data is just crystal clear that it's healthy. Um, but for the very acutely ill, um, like I, I'm dealing with a couple of diabetic. I don't want to be anybody's nutrition coach. Um, it's way above my pay grade, and, and especially their doctor. Um, but, but I have a couple of close friends who won't go see the doctor, and um, one of them is diabetic enough, her toes were turning black, and, and um, uh, had a fasting blood glucose of 400 and so on. So yeah, that's come down, the toes are starting to get some color now, and so on, but I keep trying to direct them to Robbie and, and um, Cyrus. Yeah. Uh, but when they're that acutely ill, it's like, huh, I wonder. They can't metabolize foods like potatoes anymore and beans because they're metabolically so ill, and those are healthy foods. But you put a continuous glucose monitor on them and it goes sky high until they can have some, over a period of months, have some reconstitution of their metabolic health. And then beans and, and potatoes are healthy, but they're, if they're sending their blood sugar into the 300s, you know, they're going to conclude, I can't eat that. And in that state of metabolic health, they're probably right, huh? The, yeah, the reason diabetes is complicated is because you have these different layers. Uh, you have the insulin resistance, and then you have like full-blown diabetes on top. And you have a state where there's a carbohydrate, um, there's a state where the, the processing of carbohydrates is clearly defective, but then there's all kinds of misunderstandings where people then extrapolate, oh, so carbohydrates cause diabetes and carbohydrates are unhealthy because clearly, you know, and, and people who are healthy now trying to completely avoid any fluctuation of their glucose levels and their insulin levels. And I, I think that's a massive misunderstanding as well. Um, and the other thing is with these situations uh, with Esselstein, the, these, these interventions that choose a specific diet and see results. Again, we have to be very careful not to not to make logical leaps. You can improve health and improve insulin resistance with a variety of diets. And so, in fact, when you look at the different dietary camps on the internet, each one swears by their diet being the cure for diabetes, right? And when you step back and kind of look at the broad picture, it looks a little, I don't know, you know, I don't want to be condescending, but it, it you obviously can tell that there's something that's off when the people, um, the low-fat people say that it's fat that causes diabetes. The low-carb people say it's carbs that cause diabetes. The, the vegans say it's animal protein. The, 
right? And the animal people say it's it's the, 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 the plant foods. And you clearly see that they can get, they base this on the anecdotes or the studies that happen to use that diet and they see improvements. And I interviewed um, Dr. Taylor, who's one of the one of the leading diabetologists, right? Roy Taylor, Roy Taylor from the UK. And his model is that it's all about, well, his model is all, it's that all about uh, excess fat carried in the body. Um, I don't know if I agree a hundred percent. I think it's clearly one of the, 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 the one of the major a major factor is, and I would cl- lump together uh, excess fat carried and chronic energetic excess. So it might not be the actual fat, but it might be the the chronic consumption of an excess of calories over and over for months and years that messes up our metabolism. Uh, and there, and I am, I suspect that there are other factors as well. And in reading the work of, of some people who are leading experts in diabetes and insulin resistance, and they're very dismissive of simplistic hypotheses, and they say that there's many different possibilities, and n- none of these scenarios explains all of the observations. So I have a lot of respect for that, and a lot of, uh, you know, um, I, try to, I try to resist oversimplistic, even though sim- simple is the name of the channel, but of the, the YouTube channel, but, but I, I try to resist the oversimplicity because I, I, I really don't think it helps the oversimplistic explanations. Um, but what is clear is that just moderating calories and l- losing substantial amounts of excess fat mass, that process delivers a substantial improvement and in some in some people complete reversal depending on how long they've had di- diabetes that delivers a massive improvement and that has been shown with diets that are low carb diets that are low fat and diets that are neither diets that are they're just low calories right that's the, the Roy Taylor trials the direct and and his other trials use a diet that is um, low calorie but it's not specifically low carb or, or low fat by percentage so I'm 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 convinced that the chronic energetic excess is a big lever and that by moderating A, the calories that you're taking in, the total calories, B, the junkier foods, the ultra processed foods, and again, all of these dietary trends push those same buttons, right? Whether it's whole food plant-based or whole food animal-based or low carb, they all are unanimous that uh, the junk foods, the ultra processed foods are a no-no. Uh, And to me, those are much more likely explanations than it's all fat or it's all carbs, which just does not seem to explain, you know, the bulk of the evidence is just very difficult to to reconcile all the observations with that those those models, I I would say, impossible, like not realistic, you look at the the data, it's just not compelling that it's all fat or all uh, dietary fat, right? Fat in uh, ectopic fat and all these things and intramyocellular fat uh, do play a role. But then there's a logical leap between excess fat stored where it's not supposed to be seems to play a, a fundamental role in insulin resistance. And then, oh, so we should eat less fat then. That's another logical leap, right? It's, it's, just, as, it's just as much of a logical leap as the, as the carb people saying, oh, diabetics can't handle carbs well, so then carbs must cause diabetes. It's the same type of... Um, just kind of knee-jerk logic. Uh, but it, it really doesn't explain the, the evidence. And that, at the end of the day, a good model needs to explain, if not all of the evidence, at least the preponderance, right? The, the balance of evidence. So, um, yeah. But diabetes is complicated. Admittedly, it's very complicated. And I, I had a lot of requests to make a video on diabetes, and I actually held back and had Roy Taylor on because I wanted to make sure that we, you know, that I had somebody who was a professional, who was, a, you know, somebody who does it for a living, who who knows diabetes in and out. And I, do, I didn't want to make something kind of glib over a topic so complicated. Um, but yeah, it generates a lot of emotions. Diabetes is not a, it's not an easy topic to, to touch on. A while back on Twitter, uh, I think it was Simon Hill was talking about debating someone. And, uh, and you said, well, I think these things are counterproductive. What? Why did you say that? It depends on the structure of the debate. I think it's very tricky. Um, 
I think the, the, the bottom line for any content for a general audience is that it must serve the audience. It must help them achieve clarity. And the structure of some debates, oftentimes they're geared at being you know, sensationalist, at being like click worthy, you know, come see this guy from this extreme view, debate this other guy from the other extreme view, and it's going to be a clash of titans, all this stuff that, that, you know, gets clicks and gets attention and traction on social media. But a lot of times I don't think that's helpful for an audience. And I've seen, I've seen debates where that was the proposition, the, the, the structure, and I, I see that people emerge not any clearer on the principles. And uh, a lot of times these debates don't address real scientific controversies, right? They address kind of um, misconceptions from social media, which is okay. But the structure of the debate can, can sometimes be misleading in and of itself. Uh, I'm trying to remember like a specific example from, from the, the few debates that I've watched. Um, but... I don't know some some of the Joe Rogan debates from a while back, you know, where th it's this type of this type of like here's the here's the vegan and here's the meat guy, and then they go at it, and you don't really see the fundamental topics of nutrition addressed and the questions that are real controversies and that help people at home. It's always this thing like here's one extreme, here's the other extreme, and so I'm very careful about. I'm not opposed to having a discussion uh, with with other people who have, uh, and I, li I like talking to people who have different views. Um, and I, I stimulate that on my channel. You know, I have a lot of viewers who disagree with me and we, we encourage that. We say, look, this is great. Like keep disagreeing. There's a way to disagree. You disagree by showing evidence, right? Don't, I mean, if you want to say like, like, just, I don't like it, that's fine. But ideally intelligent disagreement is where you say, here's some evidence that goes against what you said. How do you reconcile? How do you explain this? That's, I love that. Those are my favorite comments. Um, and so th that type of discussion I think is great, but I'm in the back of my mind, I'm always with videos or with, with discussions or with content, I'm always thinking, is this going to help people move in the direction of clarity or confusion? And if it's confusion, I'd rather not be a part of it I don't care if it's if it promotes my me or you know if I get exposure or if it's fun or or if I learn like that's secondary because I can do that offline right I can do that I can discuss with people without being in front of thousands of people spreading more confusion I think that's my 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 main uh, concern so when someone like Tucker Goodrich has on his, you know, he's, he's a seed oil opponent. He has on his Twitter as a tagline, data is the plural of anecdotes. As a scientist, how do you oh, respond to that? I think it's, that's pretty common. I think it's, I've seen a lot of people who have uh, the plural of data is, is oh, the plural of anecdote is data, right? I've seen, uh, I've seen a lot of people either quote that or, or include that in their bio. Um, I, think, I think it's pretty clear anecdotes are a form of evidence. We don't dismiss it, so it's a it's a mistake to to think to to swing the pendulum too far in the other direction and to say anecdotes are irrelevant. That would be a huge mistake. Anecdotes matter, particularly for the person experiencing them. If I eat seafood and I go into anaphylactic shock, I'm not going to say, "Oh, that's just an ex it's just an anecdote." So pass the pla the, pla the platter. That's ridiculous, right? So anecdotes matter. And they can be hypothesis generating. They can be, they're part of the totality of, the, of evidence. What we don't do is replace higher forms of evidence with anecdotes, especially if we have those higher forms of evidence. So we have to understand the limitations of each type of experimental approach. With anecdotes, I mean, it's not an experimental approach per se, but with anecdotes, uh, there's many moving pieces. There's things like placebo effect. There's no control group. There's un unreliability of the, 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 you know, the, the things that are reported. There's all these uh, forms of uncertainty. And so it's part of the pyramid. It's just very low. So I don't, I don't think it's irrelevant for people to bring up their anecdotes. I think it's, I think it's fine. What's a misunderstanding is to say, um, and I'm, I'm saying this in general, I'm not, I don't, I don't remember anybody uh, although it happens all the time, but but I'm saying this as a, as a general comment. 
uh, when people say, oh, the study that you just shared must be wrong because here's my personal experience. Yeah, my grandmother lived to 95. Or that, yeah. Um, so there's usually, there's just a misunderstanding of what the anecdote does and does not allow us to conclude. And oftentimes, there's no contradiction. The anecdote and the, the evidence that's being discussed, that's being discussed don't, don't contradict each other. It's entirely possible for somebody to have a good experience with the food that is associated with the higher risk because these things are populational, because there's individual variation, because there's time scales. Somebody's saying, oh, I've been eating this food for two years and I'm still fine. How can you say that it increases risk of colorectal cancer 20 years down the line? Well, you don't know what's going to happen. One of the limitations of anecdotes is you don't know what's coming, right, by definition. Um, but so this goes back to the, to this the this gap between how scientists talk and how people perceive it. Anecdotes were, may be the the prime example where for somebody with scientific training, we look at an anecdote and we almost, you know, we don't dismiss it if we're if it's in a clinical setting for the patient, but as an argument for an overarching scientific fact, it's you know incredibly uh, uncompelling. But for most people, anecdotes are incredibly convincing, right? If you, when you look at advertising, people who really understand communication are advertisers, and they use anecdotes. They don't. They don't. They don't use bar graphs and p-values in ads. They show somebody saying, "I started using this thing, or I started driving this car, and now how, look how happy I am." That's what's compelling emotionally and psychologically. So, at the same time. We have to keep explaining why anecdotes are so unreliable, but we have a clear path of learning why people connect so so deeply with with anecdotes when they're so unreliable in terms of heuristic. Um, I think it's because it's our nature. We the way we make sense of things is direct observation and then talking to people around us. Very few decisions that we make in life are guided by bar graphs and you know randomized control trials. So it's a very weird uh, concept. It's almost like this thing that I don't trust the that that uh, shifty um, you know peer reviewed what what does that even mean? But uh, but I my neighbor told me that he felt bad when he ate that, and that is something that I heard directly from somebody I know, right? Or I felt it in my skin. I felt it when I ate food X Y Z. So that's that's much closer to the to the soul than the bar graphs. Nobody connects with that. <laughs> I used to work for Steve Jobs. <laughs> After my earth science experience, mm. I went to work for him in these two companies, one that he bought, Pixar. I didn't spend a lot of time with them, but I spent some. Mm. And um, it was failing at the time. It was a very sad story. Um, and uh, And Next, which was failing at the time too, it was a very sad story, but Pixar pulled out a miracle with Toy Story, and then Next got bought by Apple, and Steve pulled out a miracle in turning Apple around. But one of the things that that I did for him was to arrange for his keynote speeches, like at the Javits Center with 4,000 people and so on. And we would spend hours together preparing these, these talks. And then the guy who took over for me after I left, when Steve died, he left Apple, but until that time, he he oversaw... 130 of Steve's keynotes, including the iPhone intro and so on. So I interviewed him, uh, and we had a fascinating talk about it. He said Steve would call, he was a night owl like you, and after the kids were to bed and um, his wife was to bed, he would call up uh, Wayne, Wayne Goodrich, and, um, and the two of them would work on their upcoming keynote for 30 days, three hours a night, and it would involve rehearsing on stage two weeks before and then rehearsing on stage in front of an audience a week before. And Steve would say, at least in the Apple days, well, this is worth a billion dollars to me, so I got to get it right. But the two of them learned a tremendous amount from Pixar, and I, I learned a few things from Pixar too, and how stories are formulated and told. You know, and it comes down to this key emotion. Scientists want to go for evidence, <laughs> But consumers, you know, it's all about the emotion. And so one of the things that I think is very clever is when companies hire PR firms. We did, you know, with Steve, I remember 
in one meeting, we, we hired this ad agency. Um, it was a wonderful ad agency. And, and uh, Steve was always so exuberant about his computers. You know, they would ask him, Steve, what is the one thing you want to get across? What is the hill you have to defend? Don't give me five things. Give me one thing. And he'd say, no, you don't understand. If, there, if it's one thing, there's seven things that make this computer so great. And it's the addition of all seven that, you know. The, I remember the head of the agency started crumpling up papers into a ball when Steve was talking like this at the conference room table. And he, set, he crumpled up six of them. And then when Steve was done with his rant, he scooped up five of them and threw them at Steve and said, catch. And they went all over the place. And then he had one left and he threw it at Steve and said, catch. And Steve caught it. <laughs> And that changed Steve forever. And you'll notice that in those Mac versus PC ads that were so, they were genius. Mm. There was a cool guy and a not so cool guy. Yep. And you wanted to be that cool guy. And it was always one thing. And all the distractions were pulled away. It was a white background. There were no distractions. And there was this one thing. And it was an emotional thing. You had to feel emotional about that thing. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. Whoa, whoa, what happened to you, PC? Kids happened. I was bought for a home. Now I have to make movies and blogs and listen to music every night. I'm crying myself to sleep mode. I'm sorry about that. You were made to stimulate 10-year-old brains with your eye life jazz. All I want to do is balance their checkbooks. I don't think 10-year-olds have checkbooks. No checkbooks, no inboxes, no employers. Just wild imaginations. But, oh, I have to go listen to some emo. Ugh! And some things are pretty emotional, like, you know, how you look with white headphone earbuds instead of black ones or something like that. And Steve became a master of it. What bothers me in science and food, and I've been involved in a few different branches of science, and one of them was global warming, as we used to call it, <laughs> until uh, what's-his-name came along and with his PR firm and decided we were going to call it climate change mm. because it was less threatening and the oil companies didn't want it called global warming. These names, you know, are just... Uh, so important when you get a he's the same guy who renamed the estate tax the death tax <laughs> because um, estate tax is something everybody's in favor of Given when you say death tax no one's in favor distance. of it yep. <laughs> and you have people like Nina Teichholz so she's really good at this she's uh, you know closely tied to the Cattlemen's Association and she has a billionaire you know investor paying her and her firm uh to just be a spokesman for, you know, the beef industry and saturated fat. And they're just so good at it because they, they hired, for example, the, the um, lobbying firm, uh, PR firm S3 for a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. And so they're able to craft these stories. Mm. Like she has this story on seed oil that has no bearing in reality whatsoever. <laughs> but it it's crafted in a way where it's so emotional to the, to the user, a scientist could never do this, would never allow themselves to do this, but it's so emotional. The opening premise was, there was no such thing as humans consuming seed oils before about 1870, and then we just did it. They were used for machine lubricants, and they show these machines, so it looks disgusting. And, uh, and it wasn't until we killed all the whales and couldn't come up with enough whale oil that we decided to turn cottonseed into an edible product. You don't need cotton. And the story is like a st emotional story heard around the world. That's all people needed to hear. There was no such thing as seed oils and they were used for machine lubricants and cotton isn't even a food and they go rancid and all that kind of That comes out of a PR, an advertising PR firm. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I agree with that um, with the importance of language and with the importance of images. And the, it, was, it was an interesting example when the, the PR guy that convinced Steve of simplicity, not only was he explaining the concept of simplicity, but then he used, uh, instead, instead of just sitting there and explaining, look, psychology has proven, here are studies that simplicity works. No, he showed it to him with an image and in his, Steve felt it in his own body by grabbing the, the one uh, paper ball and not grabbing the others like you felt it in that moment so one image is worth, forgettable yeah one image is worth a thousand words right uh, this is all true um i i think it's also it, it's easy to get 
discouraged at the amount of money and financial interest and industry interest behind a lot of these, these endeavors. Um, but this has always happened throughout history and science does win the day at the end. The problem is it's very slow and, and the cost, right? The, the, what is, what is lost while science is getting through. So, so it's kind of the, the tortoise and the hare story, right? The, the, these simplistic images and the, the industry with all the money and the emotion, this is kind of like the, the hair. It gets there much faster, uh, or, or it moves faster, but the tortoise is gonna get to, to the end eventually. Uh, and I think science consistently throughout history, scientific concepts are eventually accepted by everybody and are, um, you know, do influence policy and do influence how humans end up doing things. It's just that it takes so long. These efforts of resistance, whether they're funded by industry and they're, they're uh, you know, uh, manifestations of financial interests or whether they're the natural resistance of people to inconvenient messages, these efforts uh, are very effective at slowing down the progress of science. And they do it almost every single time, but they never, they never or almost never stop it. Every single time, you know, whether it's tobacco or whether it's vaccines or whether it's like you see that over time, over years and over decades, these things do get ingrained and even even climate change, right, which used to be a lot more controversial than it is now. We still have a lot, lot long, way to, long way to go. And even the people who have accepted it, a lot of us are living like it's not a reality. And that's a huge problem. But you clearly see the progress in acceptance. And for all the for all the, the suspicion and the problems of communication between scientists and, and the public, most people trust science. Most people trust scientists as a, as a whole. There's plenty of problems. There's plenty, plenty of shortcomings. Was that men of the year? <laughs> when, I, when I was a, yeah, when I was a, a teen, Scientists were so respected back then in 1961 mm. that uh, they made scientists men of the year. Mm. And I thought, oh, that's what I want to be. I want to be a scientist. Two weeks later, they came out, they singled out one of the scientists. And of all things, he mm. was a physiologist. Yep. <laughs> it was uh, Ansel Keys. Yep. But, you know, I sometimes when I get a little discouraged, I think, wow, well, you know, they've done a pretty good job of discrediting science in fields where they had a motivation to not believe it. Bacon is delicious, beef is delicious, the Cattlemen's Association, they got a lot of money, so they don't want you to believe that plants are healthy. Uh, I know it's really late your time. Do you want to hear a historical sure. story on sure. food that nobody knows? Sure. So the narrative goes, this guy, Robert Atkins, mm. you know, with his diet revolution, we're not mm -hmm. focusing, ushered in the low carb diet and all that. But if you like to read history books like well, I do. It was way back, yeah. Oh, way, way, way back. Yeah. Here's Carlton Frederick's 1965 book on, uh, on low carbohydrate diets. Mm -hmm. And he had a big radio show, but he was an interesting guy. Part of what was interesting about him is he was an anti-vaxxer, a very deep, so he lost a lot of advertisers on his radio show, but he just could not believe we were giving kids the polio vaccine. He was just dead set mm -hmm. against it. And also birth control pills. They caused cancer. You know, this was a man of deep emotional convictions and a great storyteller. I have snippets from his radio show and he was a great dramatic storyteller. They were getting 10,000 letters a week into the radio station. He was such a radio star. I don't know, are we any further with vaccines than we were back then? I think we might have regressed a little bit because I think more people supported vaccines then than they do now. Um, but uh, this guy came along and he got a better publisher and he got, he used words like revolutionary. Mm -hmm. So Carlton Fredericks, he's got words like Dr. Carlton Fredericks, low carbohydrate diet. <laughs> no, this guy's got a revo diet revolution. Mm. Now we're talking. And so he became known as, you know, the father of the low carb diet. The stories that we hear that get imprinted into our brains. Yeah, the rebranding, um, yeah. The rebranding is like, oh, wow. The challenge for us is to learn 
to learn more about that and to learn how the mind works receiving messages at the same time you know um it's a it's a two-edged knife i feel like because on one hand scientists have their hands tied like we don't have as much freedom uh you know because we can't just tell a story that is completely fabricated it's fictional yeah it, it just it's just not not right and not not acceptable and and the problem is in every field fiction outsells nonfiction. that's true in the movies it's true in on television shows it's true in books yeah. <laughs> and we're trying to sell nonfiction, and it, it just doesn't yeah. it doesn't sell as well but on the other hand i think having the data behind you is very powerful and wins the day eventually. The problem is, is again, eventually, yeah. how long it takes. How long it takes. The battle, the uphill battle that it is to get, to get that, uh, it, to be general knowledge. So I think um, be, being better at communicating in general and better at explaining scientific concepts is incredibly valuable because it gets us there faster. And you know, saving a lot of the trouble and a lot of the, a lot of the cost in terms of human life that would otherwise accrue if we move at, at snail pace like, like science and scientific communication often does. So I wanted to end with one final little story and that is your story with your mother. Mm. You included that in your last video. Um, and I thought, oh, now we're talking a scientist getting emotional here, telling a very emotional story that we can all um, rally around um, and have some empathy for you on, identify more closely with you, just trying to close up your mother's uh, wound. And I, I won't go into all the details, it has a nice uh, sort of ending, but um, you haven't really talked much about yourself um, up to the, that, until you started talking about your mother and moving back to Portugal to care for her, uh, which is very inspiring. And I wanted to ask, how are you feeling now? How's she doing? She's doing much, much better. She's doing, I mean, the, what I said in the video is absolutely true. The, the doctors are just floored. Uh, doctors that uh, followed her during that very difficult period. All of last year was just horrific for us. Uh, and several times we got told that it was the end of the line, that there was nothing that could be done and that we had to accept that it was the end. And... Uh, I was divided because my scientific and medical side of me didn't disagree with them. I understood what they were saying scientifically and I don't and I still even though the outcome was not what they predicted it's not that I disagree with what they said scientifically, right? So I, I understand what they said and I and I I know why they said it and they were they were right scientifically and right right statistically. But I just couldn't accept when what I told one of the doctors uh was look the if my mom passes away that when it, that happens I'll accept it, but don't ask me to accept it a second earlier, because I cannot accept it until it's too until there's nothing that can be done. And so and 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 this was and and you know a, a large part of the merit is hers because she never gave up in the at her lowest point where she was in the in the the department for palliative care which for people who don't know, palliative care is when it's just, you're just, you're in your deathbed. There's nothing to be done. Palliative means you're just keeping the person comfortable, waiting for them to die. There's nothing that can be done. There's nothing that's going to be done in, in terms of intervention, medical intervention, nothing too extreme. Uh, and she was, and she looked so debilitated. She was literally skin and bone. She had lost every ounce of muscle and and she was just, she couldn't get up from the bed. She, her, she had no strength almost to raise her arms. And her blood work was a mess, just just around you know all around a, a disaster. And um, and she turned to me and said, spontaneously out of nowhere, she said, uh, "I'm not going to die yet, right? Because I'm not ready to die yet." And this was a, we were talking about something completely unrelated. And so, if there was any doubt in my mind or any um, shred of acceptance for the situation, when she said that, I was like. You know, if she's not done, I'm not going to give up. And I remember thinking, uh, you know, because we, we had a, a year that was absolutely terrible. And we and being during the pandemic, 
we were de facto, uh, you know, uh, uh, trapped inside the house for about a year. Uh, the two of us just just trying to keep her on this side of of on, on the on the life side of things. And I remember thinking, like, you know, I'm never gonna give up. Like, one of us is gonna die in here, or she's gonna she's gonna get over this. That one of those things is gonna happen. There is no way that I'm giving up on her. Um, and and you know, we, but it was it was the battle was 99% hers. Obviously, there's only so much you can do as a caretaker. Uh, but um, the reason I talk about it in some of my videos is that it's something that has been such a powerful, such a big part of my life for the last year and a half that we've been battling this, uh, that it's like, it's my reality. I can't, I can't not talk about it. And I've, I think with time, I've, I've also become more comfortable talking about things that are close to me. In the beginning, I tried to, to keep more of a distance and to just talk about data and, and with experience, uh, you might have the same experience. I think the more you make these videos, the more comfortable you become, the more it becomes like you're actually talking to somebody on the other side of the camera, right? That, but that's a process that takes time. In the beginning, it feels incredibly strange that you're, you're sitting alone in a room, moving your arms around. It just feels crazy. But with, with time, you do, you do start to feel that there's somebody on the other side of the lens because there is. And as you, as you start to, to, as that communication builds with with people who watch your videos when you're filming you feel that the person is right there in front of you and that completely changes the way you communicate that's that's been my experience and so it's it's made me much more comfortable sharing you know sharing things or relaxing in front of the camera and just joking around and and sharing deep things and uh, as long as it's relevant to the person at home like it at the end of the day, I don't want the, the videos to be about me. I want the, video, the videos to be about the listener, about the viewer. But if I have something to share that illustrates what I'm saying, then I, I have no problem throwing that in. Um, and I think at the end of the day, people are watching for the content and for the science. Uh, but there is an element of the individual who's presenting the science. It's It's still a human being presenting presenting this thing, right? It's not a computer talking. It's not, it's not the same as, as, as I don't know, going through uh, uh, the literature. There is an element of humanity there. So uh, I've, I've gotten increasingly more comfortable doing that. There is a great book called Story, and it's written by a screenwriting instructor in Los Angeles. It is the book on screenwriting. Oh, it's phenomenal. I, I just can't say enough about it. Maybe I'm mixing up books because there's another book written by an editor, a former editor at Random House, who talked about story structure. It's in one of these two books. I love them both. Whoever said it said there has to be an element in the story somewhere where the protagonist of the story has to be able to show the audience that they're willing to give up everything for what they believe in or the audience just can't get there. So if it's a thriller, mm -hmm. you have to have Bruce Willis in chains at the complete mercy of the of the enemy. If it's a human story like Matt Damon's, we bought a zoo. He was willing to give up his career for his kids to do the zoo even when it was going bankrupt and he had a choice to go back and all that. That's when you really identify with the character. And, and I think that's what a lot of your users are identifying with when you left whatever you were doing at USC, are you still working there? No, we, we communicate, not, not officially. I, inter I, I, I interrupted all of that. I, I wrapped up all the research and everything to come here uh, to, to, see, to see if I could change things uh, health-wise for my family. But we're still, we're still in communication and talking about ideas and projects, but not, not officially, yeah. So in other words, you've given up a big chunk of your career to go tend to your mom on a whole different continent. My hat's off to you, that, that's a, and I think your viewers feel the same way. It's like, dude, this guy, he's got character. I mean, my mother is a big part of my life, so in a way, I'm giving up something to do something else with my life, which ends up being, you know, she's, she's more important than, than anything else, so if I can help her, I, I, people tell me, oh, you've done so much. I did a fraction of what she did for me, like I'm not even close to, 
to you know to to what she did for for whatever it was 10 15 20 years so i, I think i said this in a video previously it's not it's, i don't feel like it was a sacrifice i feel like it's a privilege to be able to help your parents and, and like you know um like not pay back but in a way show the gratitude and and close the circle right of of you received, I mean, the first 20 years of our lives was just take, take, take. And our parents just give, 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 give. And then to be able to give back a fraction of that, I mean it, it's, it's an incredible pleasure. This is one of the, one of the, it was, one, it was one of the hardest thing, probably the hardest thing I've ever done, but also one of the most worth it because, you know, just the, the, the value in it. It's it's just so so valuable to me what what we were able to, to accomplish and to see her. It's weird sometimes. I feel like like a, a a parent when you see like the kids starting to walk or something. It was similar for us because it took months for her to be able to get up from the bed again. And so every time I see her doing something, going to the next level, being able to get up, being able to move on her own, getting out of the wheelchair. Today she left the house on her own for the first time. In over a year, she went to the to the the corner store and, and came back. And I was watching from the window, like a like a you know like a helicopter parent. And and she went all the way back and came back. She's so happy that she's regaining some independence. Um, but I don't know. I think this is all part of life. Like it just has these these things happen. Shit happens, and we just have to deal with it and do the best we can. Uh, and one time, one day, it's going to be my turn. I'm going to need. You know, people to help me because uh, because uh, that's just uh, how life is, and so we got to be there for, of, for when people. Need yeah, them. yeah, that cycle of life. So, why do you do your YouTube channel? It, I mean, you're not making money off it. I'm assuming it's not your living. Um, it's a kind of a distraction from your career. Um, are you just doing it as a public service? Sort of. I mean, I got to a point three, four years ago when I started it that. I guess a midlife crisis, if you want to call it that, but a, a soft one, not a midlife crisis where there's a depression and where you buy a Porsche and do all these things, but a sort of a reevaluation I got to uh, maybe half of my life if I'm lucky. And I started thinking about what I had done with the first half of my life and the impact that that had. And with, what can I do with the second half of my life? How can I contribute? And that's what I landed on, that I, that what really drives me for the second half of my life would be something where I contribute something meaningful. I've, I've had every privilege. I've, you know, I've had experiences. I've had all of that. And what I'm really craving at the time was, was more of a sense of contribution. As a scientist, you spent all of these hours and years in the laboratory. And sometimes there's a massive distance between your findings. You know this, between what you discover at the bench and then a real impact in people's lives. And a lot of times I, I miss that. So I bounced around some ideas. Should I write a book? Should I start a podcast? And then I landed on making videos because um, I thought it was a better fit for my personality to be kind of face to face with people. And I and I don't regret it. And I, so I started making them. It was really difficult in the beginning, but I just I just kept doing it and it got a little easier and slowly and slowly it grew and um, but yes, the the the, the primary uh, driver was how can I contribute more? Like how can I still, you know, under the umbrella of science, but how can I help people um, access all this scientific knowledge that's out there that most people have no idea this exists? And ironically, they paid for it too. A lot of this research is paid for with taxpayer money, right? And then people have no idea this stuff exists. It's it's unbelievable. And so, um, yeah, it was, how can I, how can I do more? How can I do better? Um, and I, you know, a part of it, obviously when you're doing something that seems altruistic, you're deriving pleasure from it. So is it really altruistic at the end of the day or is it the, the satisfaction, the gratification that you get? Is that a selfish thing? I don't know. I don't think it matters as long as you're offering value. Uh, that's all that matters. So that's, yeah, that's, that's why I started making videos and that's, that's still what drives every video is like, how can I, what, what can we talk about that's going to clear up confusion, that's going to help people, 
you know, streamline their health and um, give them a tool that they don't have? How can we explain this in a way that helps them implement it, you know, that's actionable? Uh, that's always what's on the back of my mind. Well, you're a much loved YouTuber. I love your videos. Well, this has been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, and I will see you online. I see you every day on Twitter anyway, so I feel like we've known each other for a long time. Thanks for having me.